ABC Action News starts right now with breaking news. The search for two violent and very dangerous men taking a deadly turn. They're armed. They've already demonstrated a proclivity to kill people. Two people dead as more than 100 deputies and officers work overnight trying to track down those suspects in Polk County. An entire neighborhood put on lockdown overnight. Well, right now I've got my wife and daughter at home. Yeah, I'm worried as all heck. <laughs> Many people unable to go back home, waiting in their cars for the all clear. Our live team coverage starts now. The latest right now out of Polk County on this breaking news. Live from the station taking action for you, this is ABC Action News. Now at 11, caught on camera, a crane toppling over without warning right in the middle of a neighborhood. The man operating it barely able to make it out. Good evening. I'm Serena Fazan. And I'm John Sable. We begin tonight with an enormous cleanup just ending right now in Largo following an accident that sent that crane crashing into several cars and even a home. Our Cameron Poldham spent the day in Largo and joins us live. Cameron, we've heard crews just finished towing away that crane. John, as you can imagine, it is a big job tipping a 20-ton crane back upright, but that's exactly what they've been working to do for the last few hours after this tree branch brought it toppling down. Dan. All right, thank you, Lindsay. 502, and we're tracking breaking news. You are looking live at Ferguson, Missouri, racked by protests overnight in the wake of a grand jury's decision not to charge Officer Darren Wilson for the summer's shooting death of Michael Brown. The images of violence coming into our newsroom all night long through our satellite feeds. St. Louis County Police Chief just telling reporters this round of demonstrations much worse than any that immediately followed Brown's death. We're being told authorities on the ground have not fired a single shot, but did use smoke bombs to try and control the crowds of thousands. Even so, buildings, cars, even police cruisers have gone up in flames overnight. The demonstrators set fire to at least two police vehicles and torched local businesses, including a Little Caesars pizzeria. Take a look at this auto parts store consumed by fire. National Guard has been mobilized to help restore order. The violent reaction that we've been showing you out of Ferguson is the opposite of what President Obama called for just hours ago. About an hour after the grand jury's decision was announced, President Obama appealed for a calm response for the sake of Michael Brown's family. You know, Michael Brown's parents have lost more than anyone. We should be honoring their wishes. The Brown family spelled out their wishes overnight in this statement. It reads in part, we are profoundly disappointed that the killer of our child will not face the consequences of his actions. While we understand that many others share our pain, we ask that you channel your frustration in ways that will make a positive change. We're expecting to hear from that family later today in a news conference around noon. We also are expecting protests to continue in Ferguson and across the country today, including right here in the Bay Area. One is planned at Williams Park in St. Petersburg for noon today. We'll check in with our Adam Weiner in our next half hour with more on what other protests are planned in the Bay Area. And as you mentioned, Dan, uh, Ferguson's not the only place that's seeing protests raging overnight. We want to show you some video now. This is a scene in New York's Times Square, where, as you can see, there are hundreds clogged the streets to protest the grand jury's decision. Those protesters then marched up to the city's west side with their hands raised, chanting, hands up, don't shoot, one of the defining mantras of the Ferguson protest. So at 5.05, how did we get to this point? So Garrett Hake from our sister station in Kansas City gives us an in-depth look at the evidence the 12-person grand jury used to make its decision. We got an extraordinary look inside the testimony that the grand jury was able to take a look at. And one of the things that's interesting here is Officer Darren Wilson's interview with other police the day after the shooting when he describes being charged by Michael Brown as why he fired the shots. He talks about a very aggravated, aggressive, even hostile posture with Michael Brown making a little hop and then he starts running towards the officer who then fired what would be the fatal shots. When Prosecutor McCullough was explaining the difficulties in coming to an indictment in this case, he talked about the fact that so many of the different pieces of evidence and the different witnesses contradicted each other and contradicted this statement. Eyewitness accounts must always be challenged and compared against the physical evidence. Many witnesses to the shooting of Michael Brown made statements inconsistent with other statements they made and also conflicting with the physical evidence. 
There are hundreds of pages of documents that follow a similar line here, all making for a fascinating look inside a grand jury, usually secret, but now open to all and sure to be parsed as much as possible as people continue to look at this case for a very long time to come. And of course, you can count on us to keep you informed about what is going on in Ferguson all day long today. Look for live reports throughout the morning right here on ABC Action News and also live team coverage straight ahead on Good Morning America. If you haven't already, we want to encourage you to download our free mobile app, Action News Now, ABC Action News Now. We'll send you push alerts every time there's a major development in this closely watched case. Two minutes after six, back here at home, a St. Pete family dealing with a new round of tragedy this morning desperately needs your help. On Saturday, a fire ripped through this home right here off Popano Drive uh, with 11 people inside, including nine children. Everybody got out safely after one of the kids, a 13-year-old boy, smelled smoke. But this family is certainly no stranger to tragedy. Back in September, Francis McDermott, the man who owns this house and father to five of the children living there, was found shot to death inside his pickup truck. The family does not have insurance, and they're now left to try to figure out what to do next. But there is a way that you can take action to help them. A GoFundMe page has been set up to benefit the McDermott family this holiday season as they struggle now to cope with tremendous loss. We posted a link to that page on our website and shared it on the ABC Action News Facebook page. We hope that you'll share it with your friends as well to try to help out this family. 505, we want to get to this crime alert out of Sarasota where police are trying to track down the man accused of installing skimmers onto ATMs in order to steal your personal information. Here is security camera video of that suspect who police say installed those devices at SunTrust Bank's ATMs on Main Street and South Tamiami Trail. Police think he's tied to a ring of ATM card thieves hitting SunTrust banks all across Florida, from Tampa to Orlando to Fort Myers. So how do you keep from getting skimmed yourself? Well, we're taking action for you with these tips from the FBI. First, take a good look at the ATM. Be suspicious. If you see anything loose, crooked, or damaged, you can even reach up and jiggle it a little bit. Make sure it doesn't come loose. Use an indoor ATM if you can, since crooks are a lot less likely to install skimmers there. And be wary of ATMs in tourist areas. They're popular targets for the bad guys. Out here now at the dot-com wall, it's a feeling that most of us have had at one point. You panic. You start to look everywhere. You're freaking out. That's what happens when we lose sight of our smartphone, even just for a second. You know, it turns out that it's actually pretty common, as evidenced by this scene from last week's Modern Family. Oh, no! Oh, my gosh, I thought I lost you again. Wait, wait, back up. Again? Oh, yeah, when we almost got killed, I thought I lost my phone. It was really scary. Well, if you're anything like Haley here, you know smartphone separation anxiety is a very real thing. And now researchers say they have the data to prove it. A new study had people complete a word search puzzle, but some of them had to do it with their devices, without their devices, just out of reach, or actually with their devices, just out of reach. And those people not only did worse on the test, but their heart rate went way up and they reported feeling more anxious. Okay, now you may not want to admit to having smartphone separation anxiety, but I'm told that admitting it is the first step to healing. All right, so here goes. I'm Dia, and I have smartphone separation anxiety. If you want to share your story as well, go to our website. You can also read the full study, abcactionnews.com. I admit it, Dia. Mm hmm It might be more of a mom thing. I, guess I walk out of the house without mine all the time. <laughs> My wife gets really it upset. It is a mom thing, you know. I agree. <laughs> all right, coming up next in your morning sprint.